know we've had some of the younger children go out and uh, the doors have been locked. <laughs> and we saw our security guard there. <coughs> so what in the world is happening this morning? Well, I'm going to teach the Bible. That ought to be enough to scare everybody after that. I uh, want to share some things with you. There is no easy way to preach this sermon. If there is, I haven't found it. I'll have to admit, after preaching for 49 years, I've been saved about 44 years, I've been preaching. I've never heard a preacher preach this sermon. And the reason is, is because everybody already has their minds made up of what they're going to do anyway, so it maybe it doesn't really matter. But Christ is going to all the world and preach the gospel to every person. So that's the priority. God wants people to know that he loves them, that he paid for their sins by his death on the cross, coming back from the dead and said, we believe he did it for us. He gave us a free gift, everlasting life. And he says, he says, preach the forgiveness of sins. If he died for every man, then every man is a sinner. Right? We've all sinned. Everybody agree to that so far? Yes. So we're on the same page so far? We've all sinned? And we all need forgiveness? Is that true? Yes. yes. Now, there's sometimes we think about things, but we don't do them. But with God, He even knows what we think. That's enough to scare us to death. So I want to cover a few things with you that I hope will be a blessing to you. And um, I have... Uh, a few things that you may not totally agree with me on, but that, that, that's okay. Remember, whatever the situation is, a lot of times we can't go back and change things. We have to start from where we are and go from there on. And so, wherever you find yourself in this little message that I'm going to give this morning, just believe this. God loves us, and he forgives us. And God is a God of first chance, second chance, third chance, third, fourth, fifth. It don't matter. God is a good God. Sometimes when we don't know what the Bible says, we adopt philosophies because of what we see or hear in the news. And that's not always right, not for the Christian. God gave us his word, and I believe that we should seek to go by it. So take your Bible and turn there to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 3. As you know, we have just elected uh, an elder and reinstated one that was up for the re-election, a couple of deacons, and there's something here that I want you to see in the scriptures, and, and if I don't cover it, uh, then you may wonder. Remember, regardless of what the view you have on something, uh, it usually boils down to these three things. You have a third of the people that will think it's right. A third of the people think it's wrong, and a third of the people don't care which way it is. So every time you teach something, there's always somebody who has preconceived views and notions about things, and they may agree or disagree. But I want you to look at the scriptures, and I want you to have to formulate this in your own mind, so that you don't say, well, the preacher said, no, I saw it in the book, and now I've got to be able to wrestle with this. So here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, look in verse 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop or an elder, he desires the good work. A bishop or an elder then must be blameless. That doesn't mean perfect. It means somebody who has corrected a problem and going on. You never find perfect people. There aren't no such things. You find people that have corrected problems and one in the right direction. And so you try to find those individuals. He says, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given the hospitality after teach. But there's a statement there that says, the husband of one wife. This usually comes down to a lot of trouble when trying to find a pastor sometimes. Can he be married and divorced and then remarried and still be a pastor? Some say yes, some say no. I've seen it split churches. That one little issue alone. Down here in verse um, 12, it says, Let the husbands, or the deacons, be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. It says the same thing about the deacons, a uh, husband of 
you know, one life. Well, some say that just means one at a time. <laughs> I'm serious now. Others I've had said, well, we're under grace. This doesn't apply. Well, because we're under grace, we don't have to go by this. So you can just tear this chapter out of your Bible. I mean, literally say that. So now, what, what, what is the teaching on this? Well, let me just give you the best understanding that I can. I've read as many commentaries, and I can't get much from them. So I've done a lot of studying in the scriptures of trying to find, there's got to be a harmony. There's got to be a right and wrong. There's got to be a certain place that says, okay, this is the way we're supposed to believe. And if we don't find out what God says, then we just do whatever we want, believe whatever we want. And so I want you to take your Bible, look in Genesis in chapter 2. Now, a couple of Sundays ago, we preached a sermon on the way it was meant to be. Well, we're not going there today, but it's similar. We spoke on Sodom and Gomorrah that day. It's not going to be that today. So in Genesis in chapter 2, I want you to look there in verse 21. And this is on page 8, and I know it's called a reference Bible, or one of the Bibles that's long to you. But look in verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. He slept. Took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh instead thereof, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. They shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, take your Bible and turn to the book of 1 Corinthians and chapter 7. 1 Corinthians and chapter 7. Because so sooner or later, you know, you're going to have to deal with these verses in the Bible. You can either pass them over or try to explain them, you know, because sooner or later it affects everybody's life. But marriage, I wasn't going to call love, sex, and marriage, but marriage, divorce, and remarriage. It is a subject that hits everybody in this room. Either you get married or you don't. So that still touched you. Or if you get married, it might be that you'll get divorced. And if you do get divorced, then you remarry. And then you might deal again and so forth. Where does God stand on all this stuff? Remember this. In my ministries, I have used people that have been married, divorced, and remarried. I had one that ran a whole Christian school. One ran my bus ministry. I've used them in Sunday school teachers. I've used them all over the ministry. So I can do just like what God says. He forgives. And they're not second-class citizens. They're not second-rate Christians. They're not to be looked down upon or despised just because somebody has been married and divorced and remarried. But what needs to be done is look at it from what God's Word says. Let's replant the seeds of destruction and the young people that's coming up, and they don't take marriage seriously. I believe we should take it very seriously. Marriage is not a game. I have married a lot of people. You have a Bible college, and you have all the couples that want to get married, generally at the end of a semester. We had so many, one year I had to use many rice. <laughs> and I'm talking about... They thought we had the Colorado Bible College, and it was the Bible College. But some go to college just to look for their name. Well, it's a good place to look, I guess. Now, I thought what would help, there's a couple words that you may not really understand what they mean. If I was to say the word adultery, you say, I know what that is, but it generally is a reference toward Adults who are married have an affairs, as they call it today. The word fornication is a little different. And uh, this is also found in the scriptures, but let me from an 1828 Webster's Dictionary. And uh, this is what it says. It says, to commit lewdness as an unmarried man or woman 
or as a married man with an unmarried woman. But it's a reference toward the unmarried. So when it talks about that in the scriptures, one is toward adults who are not faithful, that are married, not faithful. The other is fornication, which is where we get the word porneo. It's pornea. And it's a reference toward those that are single, not married. So sometimes an adult married person will commit fornication with a person that's not married. Now, that's how it's, I believe, used in the scriptures. So whenever you see that, you understand where these scriptures are coming from and what God is trying to explain to us. So here in 1 Corinthians in chapter 7, look here in verse 1. Now concerning the things which you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. And that doesn't mean walk up and get it. No. It doesn't mean a hug on the shoulder. It's talking about the relationship between a man and a woman. If a man, for the present time, because verse 26 in this chapter says, for the present time. He said, I'm going to tell you some things because of the time in which we live, because of the persecution, the heartaches, the troubles, the trials, and so forth that we get. It might be better right now not to get married. But he says, not everybody can handle that. And that's why he says in verse 9, if they cannot control themselves, uh, let them marry, for it's better to marry than to burn with the passion, the desire, the lust for toward one another. So God says, if, if you can't, then it's better you get married. If you can't control yourself. Because of the time in which they live. So look at verse 2. Uh, nevertheless, to avoid fornication. In other words, people that are not married. To avoid that. He says, let every man have his own wife. Not somebody else's. His own. Let every woman have her own husband. Verse 3. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. And likewise also the wife unto the husband. It means that they're supposed to meet the physical needs of each other. It means that her body is not hers, but belongs to the man. It means his body doesn't belong to him, it belongs to the wife. And they are supposed to meet each other's physical needs. This is the way God designed it. It's a beautiful plan. It'll work God's way. Now, in verse 4, he says, The wife hath not power or authority of her own body, but the husband. Likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Then he says in verse 5, Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time. In other words, it's kind of like this. They say, well, if an ox falls in the ditch, you're not going to leave it in that ditch just because it happened to happen on a Saturday, the Sabbath day. He says, you still got to get the ox out of the ditch. But if that ox falls in the ditch every day, now you've got to fill the ditch or kill the ox. <laughs> Now, when it comes between a man and a woman, it says, Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that you may give yourself to fast and prayer, and come together again, and get this phrase, that Satan tempt you not for your lack of control. God knows that he has given to us desires of our physical flesh. And he says they are to be met by the other party. And it is defrauding the other one when you don't do so. And not to do so could cause Satan to get an advantage by causing the person to go someplace else and commit adultery. God says that is a sin. That is wrong. And just because the one who went and committed adultery, this person often says, well, I'm the innocent party. I never get into who's the innocent party. I don't really know. I don't really care. Because he might have done that because the person violated the scriptures right here and didn't take care of the person's need. Now, I don't know. I don't even get into that. But I have many people who want me to perform weddings. I don't even like performing weddings. There's not even a verse in the Bible that says pastors must perform weddings. And the reason is because I don't feel like today anybody's ready to get married. They're old enough, but I don't know if they're wise enough. And I don't know if anybody should ever get married. But anyway, <laughs> there, isn't, there isn't anything that I probably don't understand about marriage. Love, sex, or marriage. I've been married in a couple more months. It'll be 50 years. I think that's a good enough track record that says I know a little bit. 
I've counseled a lot of people over the years. Now, there's people who have been married, divorced, and remarried. And I have a lot of people who come to me and they said, you know, I've, I've been married, but then I got divorced and got remarried. And you would always think that the second time around would be better. And I can state this. I would say 75% of the time, it's not. You see, when you get married, even the first time, you're not just marrying two people. You're marrying families. You're marrying his mom and dad, her mom and dad, grandparents. It becomes one big family. And buddy, problems on both sides, you may have to live with for the rest of your natural born life. I had a person tell me one time, he said, I'll dare you to condemn me to a life of being single. I says, I, uh, I didn't create you. I didn't make you get married. I didn't make you get divorced. I didn't, come to think of it, I didn't make you do anything. Why are you blaming me for your problem? Don't do that. I'm the nice guy here. I'm just trying to help people. But I want them to understand where God is coming from. So he says here, the fraud do not want the other. And then he says something I think that uh, we all need to kind of put together. Uh, look there in the book of Matthew in chapter 1. The book of Matthew in chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. I want to read something to you that I wish that I could change. But I, I can't change it. And just because I did something years ago, I don't want it to be used as justification for somebody else. You see, I ran away with this young girl. She was 17 years old. We ran away to Anderson, South Carolina, and we got married. Was that the right way to do it? No. No. I was wrong. And just because we've been married almost 49 years, do you think I recommend other people just run away and get married? No, I don't. Well, it worked all right for you. That doesn't make it right. So I don't try to teach people to do what I've done just because I did it. If it's wrong, it's still wrong, even if the preacher did it. But I can't go back and change what I've done. It was wrong. And I wrote a poem. I want to read you my poem. You probably have three points in a poem. Here's my poem that I wrote. I wrote this years ago. In the dead of night, before the morning light, two hearts were young and gay. Before the justice of the peace on a five dollar bill, a rose was stolen away. This is the wedding that could have been had the Lord had his way with me. To have the father give his daughter away to a man for all to see. After all these years, one thing I regret are memories that will never be. To rob a man of the master's plan is a deed that still haunts me. Take the time and read the poem below and remember to always do right. For the time will come with the setting of sun that you'll know and enjoy with delight. And here's the way it should have been. This is from me to my wife, the way it should have been. It seemed so bright, you dressed in white, awaiting my hand in yours, to make promises before man and vows before God, who looks on from heaven's bright shores, to love you, honor you, protect and provide, is my promise to ever be true. To love no other but faithful abide and be the husband God meant for you. For me to love you as Christ loved me is the true test of love divine. To give to my wife this supreme sacrifice is the commitment of this life of mine. As a token of my love for you, I place this ring upon your hand, the circle which is eternal in our desire for the master's plan. Our hearts, like candles, shall melt together as one as we walk in the warmth of God's Son. 
Bone of my bones. Flesh of my flesh. Your mind till our race is run. To hear those words, you may not kiss the bride. There's a moment to enjoy for life. But better still are those words so real. I pronounce you man and wife. Marriage is a good thing. Marriage is an honorable thing. Marriage is a right thing. But sometimes we don't always do things the way God intended. We never had pictures of our wedding. I never gave her dad the opportunity of walking her down the aisle and giving her to a man he trusted in. I violated all of that. I ruined all of that. Forty-nine years later, it still bothers me. I wish I'd just done right. But I wasn't raised right. I didn't even know what was right. At the time, it didn't really matter to me. But when you have kids, then you have grandkids, you want them to learn how to do it God's way. I think it's better God's way. I think there's more precious memories God's way. Now here in the book of Matthew in chapter 1, look there in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for thou, that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Now remember this, she is already with child. Joseph has not touched her. But it says husband, it says wife. But that's because, see, Jewish way of looking at it was they had a, a long engagement. And their engagement was looked upon as marriage. But they were not to touch each other until the day of the wedding. If during that period of time, the mom and dad was supposed to prove her virginity, and be able to present her to that man, she never been touched. But if they got married, and he finds out that she wasn't pure, Moses had given the, the right to give a divorce, because that's fornication, they were not yet married. And that's the exception clause, I believe, in the scriptures. He was then able to put her away, and this is what Joseph was going to do. And he wasn't going to marry her. And he was right in doing so. And would have done so if God hadn't intervened. So I believe this is what this scripture here is talking about. Look in verse 25. And knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. So even though he went ahead and took her to be his wife, he never touched her until after the son. Jesus Christ was born. So that means that the marriage had never been consummated before this period of time. But they were still looked upon as husband and wife because they were engaged. That's an important period of time. Now take your Bible and turn there to the book of Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. We have people here that ask the question that even many people ask today. And if you look there in chapter 19 of Matthew and look there in verse 3, the Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? You say, What do you mean by every cause? Irreconcilable differences would do, wouldn't it? Today, you can get divorced just for about any reason you want. This is the same problem they had then, for every cause. It doesn't really matter. 
So how is Jesus going to get out of this one? These were the religious leaders of his day. And Jesus said in verse 4, And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read? He's taken them back to the beginning. And reestablishes the way it's supposed to be. Have you not read that? He which made them at the beginning, made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Now get the rest of the verse. Wherefore they are no more two but one flesh. What therefore, and you ought to circle this word there in your Bible, God, God hath joined together. Let not, and you ought to circle that word, man put asunder. What God joined together, no man was to ever put asunder. Now, I want you to look there. Hold your place right here, because I want to come back here. But we're so close to the book of Malachi. Malachi. Malachi chapter 2. And look there in verse 11. I want you to see what God says about divorce. In verse 11, now listen, I'm not interested in whether or not you have already or you haven't. Or you've been married and divorced and remarried. I don't care how many times. I'm talking about we start from where we are and go forward. God can forgive everything. I'm not pointing stones at anybody. I'm not throwing starts at anybody. I want you to understand where God stands and what I believe the Scripture says. If we don't adopt some kind of of a standard of right and wrong. Then we sow the seed of destruction in the young college kids and the young married couples coming up that will never understand. Yes, there's a lot of problems in marriages. A lot of heartaches. But at least whenever I get to the top of the hill, I can look at my wife and says, we made it. We did it. And there's a lot of disappointments and heartaches and all the things that you have in marriage. So you can get rid of that when you get you another one, but I can guarantee you, it's gonna, you're going to have it all over again. It don't stop. And then we plant the seeds. Of, well, if it doesn't work for you, just get rid of that one and get you another one. And today it doesn't matter because there's no shame in anything anymore. But I just want to try to get you to see what God says about it. Whether you believe it or you don't believe it. It's not between you and me. It's between you and God because you don't have to answer these verses. If you don't agree with what I'm saying, you're going to have to have another answer for these verses. And I don't twist scripture. And I don't try to use my preconceived ideas to try to make it say what I want it to say. I just simply says what it said. Verse 11, Judah hath dealt treacherously, and abominations committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. And it goes on down here and he says in verse 14, Yet ye say, Wherefore, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, who was a witness of your marriage? God. Marriage is in the eyes of God. God's the one that designed the institution of marriage. A man and a woman, and they shall be two. And what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. No man, no judge, has a right to deny it. You say, well, it happened. Yeah, I know it happens. Because of sin. He said, well, what about Moses? Because of the hardness of their heart. They're not going to do what God says to. Now, you can have second best, but the best, the ideal is, wouldn't it be great if a man and a woman, when they get married, really love each other and love the Lord and serve the Lord all the days of their life? But sin always has a way of finding its way in. And sin is so destructive. It's so hard upon the people that were married. It's so hard upon the kids. It's so hard upon grandkids. And even when people get remarried, isn't it so hard from time on the exes and the stepkids and all the things that they have to go through? It doesn't affect just one life. It involves a lot of people's lives. And so we try to find out, well, what does, what does God's Word say? What should I do? Now, we may not be able to correct what's been done, but I can at least take a stand and try to advise those from here on out. But this is what God says to do. Now, look what he says. He says, And the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet is she the, thy companion, and the wife of thy covenant. 
In other words, when me and Betty got married, God was a witness. Now, according to the scripture, if I divorce my wife and marry another, and my wife is still alive, God says that I commit adultery. And the reason is because even though man gave me the right, and it's legal, law, it says it's right. So if you get divorced, you get remarried. So I can get the right. But God says I commit adultery. And if she marries another, she commits adultery. He said, well, why? Because it hasn't been severed with God. They were married in God's eyes. Even though man can do whatever he wants. And many, many people do. But it still won't solve the problem. Now, look what he says. In verse 15, And did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit? And wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed? Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. Don't think just because you start getting old. I'm going to take this 40-year-old woman and trade her in for two twenties. <laughs> you ain't fired for two twenty. And look at verse 16. Verse 16. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he, and get this, hated putting away. That's hating divorce. The putting away. He hates divorce. Don't say God loves divorce. And God wants to. No, 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 no. You won't find a verse that says it. God hates it. Because it's sin. Because of the hardness of people's heart. And we said, well, because of fornication, you can't. All right, go back there to Matthew in chapter 19. Fornication is whether you're not married before you get married. And then the person finds out that person has the right to the divorce. Now, look there in Matthew chapter 19. The question was, did we get divorced for any reason? Because they had it by that time. I divorced thee, I divorced thee, I divorced thee. You divorced me. Well, that was hard, wasn't it? And he says here in verse 8, He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you or permitted you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. Christ is speaking. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, like Joseph and Mary, before they came together, shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. And the disciples said unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it's not good to marry. In other words, if you're talking about forever, you're talking about until death, what if I get a hold of an old battle axe and I got to live with that witch for the rest of my life? He said, you better not to get married. And what did Jesus say? He says in verse 11, all men cannot receive this. You got that right. Listen, marriage is a serious business. It is a serious thing. It's not to be taken lightly. It's not, we're together until I get mad at you or you get mad at me. Until we're no longer combat. Remember, opposites attract and then attack. <laughs> The very reason you want to get rid of that bird is the reason you wanted him to start with. And then you find that you can't change him. The man thinks, I hope she never changes. And the woman says, it won't take much, I can change him. <laughs> and they spend the rest of their life trying to change the guy. And the guy says, what changed you? They thought they got this little flower. And then wilted. Well, I'll take this man and wilt, wilt, wilt. <laughs> now, turn in your Bible to the book of Romans in chapter 7. <coughs> Romans chapter 7. Hear it quickly. <coughs> Romans chapter 7. And notice what it says. In verse 1, chapter 7. This is on page 1199 in an old scope of reference Bible. He says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. How that the law hath dominion over man as long as he lives. But when a man's dead, you don't have to worry about the law anymore. You know when you die, you don't have to worry about stopping at stop sign and red lights and nothing. Why? You're dead. You don't have to pay taxes anymore if you're dead. 
Well, they'll find a way to tax it. But, you know. <laughs> Verse 2. For the woman which hath a husband, bound by the law to her husband, and you ought to underline this, as long as he what? As long as he's nice to you. It's as long as he lives. But what is no longer nice? You mean you're going to stick me with this ball for the rest of my life? I'm not sticking anybody with anybody. I didn't, I didn't make anybody get married. I'm just saying you better think this thing through before you get married. Are y'all listening? <laughs> You've got to listen to what the scriptures are saying. This is serious business. That's why you need the Lord. That's why you better hope your wife and get her in church so she can get some teaching from the Word of God so that she'll be the kind of wife she's supposed to be and the kind of a mother she's supposed to be. And you better see that your husband gets in church wife because he needs to know how to stay strong in the Lord. That's why you don't try to, well, I'll take him any way they are and I'll change him later. No, you better get him right when you get him. Not because he gives you a bunch of promises and pledges. Does he love the Lord now? And he proves his love by his faithfulness to the Lord. If he takes liberties with you, he might take them with somebody else after you. You better do right. Look in verse 2. He says, But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. Now get this. So then again, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man. She shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband is dead, she is free. So that she is no adulterer, though she be married to another man. Is that clear or is that not clear? Now we may not like this, but this is the word of God. Now there's a lot of other things that says things in the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 7 that gives a lot of light and help tremendously. I'll teach that later at another date. Too much of this at one time can be devastating. <laughs> you don't want to hit somebody and hit them and kill them. So I just try to pitch it in, I'll back off for a while. <laughs> About seven days will do it. <laughs> but this is this is so important, and I want you to understand. Not everybody does everything right. Sometimes we don't even know. Is it like me? I, I, I it was years later if I find out, you know what God said. But I, I didn't know. And some of y'all may be in the same boat. But I want you to adopt God's view on it. And say, well, what, what if I already messed up? There's a God in heaven that says, confess. Say, Lord, it was wrong. I see it now. And it was sin. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. But I did. And God says, help forgive you. And you go on from there. But you don't live the rest of your life under guilt and a load, a yoke of iron. When you own up to truth and confess it for them, I was wrong. And you can have all your reasons. I don't even want to know a reason. God can lift that big old yoke of iron off your neck and you can live as a free man for the rest of your life. God is a God of forgiveness and a second and third chance. I apply this teaching to the man that's going to be the pastor, an elder, or a deacon. I don't make the rules, but I try to go by them. I want God to honor what God's word says. And if a man's been married and divorced and remarried, I believe it disqualifies him for the office of the pastor as an elder or as a deacon. I didn't make that rule. But since I believe it, I'm going to go by that rule. There's a lot of things I may fail in. And I'm not saying I'm totally right on this. You'll find there's a lot of good preachers around this country that will not agree with what I just told you. And they will have justifications and people can get married and divorce all. Do whatever you want, but make sure you're clean between you and the Lord. And you did what you did because you believe that's what God's Word says. Not just what the preacher said, but you believe that from the Word of God. And if you got that liberty, do whatever you want to do. And I will love you and I will help you. I don't care how many times you've been married. My sister was married nine times. Nine. Oh, have I dealt with it? Oh, yes. I've only got four sisters, but I've got 17 brother-in-laws. <laughs> you think that's funny? <coughs> and I buried a lot of them. 
I didn't marry any of them. Oh. But sometimes we just live and learn, and sometimes we live and never learn. And I just want you to be a little bit wiser. But you've got kids coming up, you've got grandkids. And if you don't teach them to have some standard and take marriage seriously, they may not take it seriously. And I want to look up here. This hand represents you and me. The wall represents sin. Remember, God loves all of us. God hates our sin. And just because you didn't do that sin doesn't mean you haven't done another. So you don't point fingers at anybody. That doesn't make, just because a person is messed up in life, that doesn't make them a second class citizen or a second class Christian. They're loved with the same love that you and I are loved with if we never got divorced. And only by the grace of God has my wife stuck with me. If I was her, I'd have left me a long time ago. And you sitting here too. It's not because you're so good. It's called only by the grace of God. But look, God loves us, but he hates our sin. And it says we've all sinned and we're all condemned, but God loves us. But he wants us to go to heaven. And to go to heaven, you've got to be perfect and righteous as God. <laughs> that eliminates everybody I know. Because of sin, we can't get in. So God says you cannot save yourself. This hymn represents Jesus Christ. He's the Lord God in the flesh. He came into this world because he does love us. And he hates our sin. Because our sin separates us from the Lord. So Christ took the sin, paid for it on the cross, came back from the dead. Said, so we'll believe he did it for us. He gave us a free gift, everlasting life. And we get to go to heaven on what he did for us. That's a gift. That's free. That's the best news in all the world. So when you accept the payment Christ made for you, all sin forgiven. I don't care what it is. You haven't done anything too great that God can't forgive you. And all of us need forgiveness. So God loves us. And he loves you. If you have never trusted Christ as your Savior, I urge you to do so. I want you right now in the quietness of this moment, even when I'm talking to you, you can say this between you and God. God knows your thoughts. They make a mistake this way. Lord, I'm a sinner. God says you are. Everybody else knows you are too. You know it too. Just admit it. God, I'm a sinner. And I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid for my sins. And right now, I'm going to trust Him. It's my only hope of going to heaven. And friend, God said, if you would trust Him, He'd give you eternal life. And you go to heaven on what Christ did for you. That's good news. That's news in the world. Let's pray, shall we? Every head bowed and every eye closed and no one looking around. If you're here this morning and you say, yes, I want to be certain of going to heaven when I die. I realize I cannot earn my way to heaven. I'll never be good enough. I'm a sinner. But I believe Christ died for sinners. He died for me. And right now in the quietness of this moment, I will accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. And when God said if you would trust Him, He would save you and give you eternal life. Would you do that? If you're making that decision, I'm going to ask you in just a moment to raise your hand so that I'll know that i made sense to you and you'd like to have us pray for you. So we'll just get in it very quickly and put it right back down. Then with all, say, yes, I'll trust Christ as my Savior this morning. And Bridge, I'd like you to pray for me. You want to talk to us just very quickly, but right back down. With your head still bowed and eyes closed, is there anything you need to talk to the Lord about? God knows. He loves you. Made a payment. If you trust Him as your Savior, you're God's child. You start from where you are. From wherever you learn truth. And say, this is what I believe now. And I'm going to do my dead little best to try to present the truth, live the truth, do right. I want God's blessings upon me. I will do anything I can to try to help you. I don't care what your problem may be. I'm going to try to help you. Our Father, we thank you so much for this time together, for loving us, giving us your word. And, and Father, we pray that you help us to apply it and to be patient and kind one to another, to love each other as we should. And help each man here to let his wife and the wife to love her husband, to love the children, be the right examples. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.